So you've heard about the tragedy of the commons. Now, the question is, does it have to happen? And somehow this picture gives the answer. The answer is no. Apparently, on the left-hand side, there has been a tragedy of the commons. Basically, the forests are all gone. There is nothing that grows anymore. But on the other side of the border, there's still a lot of plants growing. And somehow there must be a difference, and that difference can be used basically to change the outcome. And this course, in fact, is about the question, how can we avoid a tragedy of the commons, among others? A tragedy of the commons, such as environmental pollution, climate change, overfishing, you know, all those problems that are around, big problems, actually problems, some of which have been around for thousands of years. And apparently are still partially at least unsolved, right? So we hear a lot that our main problem is lack of sustainability, that we're overusing resources and that would end badly according to some predictions, many predictions probably. And the question is, um, does it have to end that badly or can we do something about it? And if yes, what can we do? So in fact, uh, that paper on the tragedy of the commons is quite old. I think it's from 68. It goes back to Gerrit Harding, a controversial figure, by the way, if you want to look him up. Um, that was published even in Science. And uh, to our surprise, in the subtitle, it talks about the population problem. Not talking about environment or cooperation. It talks about population problem and uh, what shall we maximize? So it's about maximization from his point of view. And in fact, um, we don't know what is the right goal function for this planet. There's no, not even a science to determine that. But basically the claim is that everyone is just trying to do the best for himself or herself. And this will lead to suboptimal systemic outcomes will be bad for our planet. And so some people have concluded we should be bringing up systems for centralized control that would impose those optimal solutions on this planet and if needed also interfere with people's behavior. Is that the only solution or is it even a good solution? Would it be a solution that would work, you know? This is what all the discussion is about that we have, I guess, now every day. We also read news such as this one. One third of the world's food is wasted. So if uh, people say planet is overpopulated, then is that even true? Or are we just not making good use of the resources that we have? Is it a lifestyle problem? Is it a logistic problem? Is it a coordination or cooperation problem? There are different perspectives on this. On probably it's all of this or partly each of this. And I hope that uh, we'll be able to learn a little bit about those problems and that we'll get a new perspective on new solution approaches. And I'd like to start with the coordination problem and you all know it because we are moving around in public, we are facing other people, we need to walk around each other. And that's obviously a coordination problem and that coordination problem can be actually formulated in terms of game theory. And game theory is working with, as you learned, pay of matrices, and this is the pay of matrix of the coordination problem of two pedestrians that want to walk around each other. So this walks this way, that walks that way, and basically to get around each other, each pedestrian can go at either left or right. So there are two players interacting and they have uh, two possible behaviors, left or right. And now it turns out both go left 
then they succeeded. So that's a be beneficial outcome. So there will be a payoff B greater than zero. If one goes left, the other goes right, then basically they still stand in front of each other. So they didn't succeed. There's no payoff. Same thing if one goes right and one goes left. And if both go right, however, it's as beneficial as if both go left. So that's the payoff matrix. And in fact, this is the well known pay payoff matrix of a coordination game. Okay, now what will happen in such a situation? It's actually more interesting than people would think. So, any ideas? Yes? So they iterate. And that is sometimes happening. We've all experienced that. But that kind of situation is happening most often if the likelihood to go right and the likelihood to go left is the same, 50%. And obviously that going, you know, the zigzagging, that's, uh, that's inefficient, right? And we'll see what happens. All right, uh, for this, we go into game theory and uh, you've uh, already heard about game theory. That's the book that established it all. So that was during World War II. Obviously resources were short, uh, optimal action had to be taken. And that's why basically, game theory was invented for being more effective in terms of the outcomes that uh, were chosen. So it's about interaction and uh, taking into account goals and preferences of the participating players. There could be conflict. And so the question really is, what would be the outcome? It's often not obvious. So what would be interesting questions for you? Anybody, please. What do you want to learn in this class? Come on. <laughs> Something. I just want to find out the new center of that monopoly. Now, this slide actually, you know, is, this, this is, is this trying to make a point. Can we change the game? Right? <laughs> so, you wanted to say something. Uh, that we have to be interested in coordination by all the animals, for example, ants. All right. That's true. Now, as you also learned a bit already, I will learn a lot more about it. There are different kinds of game theory. And these are the most important areas in game theory. Classical game theory was very much interested in equilibria. Evolutionary game theory is more interested in dynamics. And then there is behavioral game theory. So how do real people behave? in many cases, not as assumed in those theoretical approaches. So corrections are needed. For example, a bounded the rational approach to agents or players. For a couple of minutes, I will focus on evolutionary game theory. And there is a paper that you may want to read if you're interested in details. The question is, how would the distribution of behaviors I in populations A of a society change in time. And there are different things that can happen. Basically, people may change their behavior I to some other behavior I prime. That would happen with a certain transition rate W. And it would be proportional to the number of people who are in behavior I and can change it, right? Now, I prime could be any other behavior. That's why we have to sum up over I prime. And that's basically all the actions that will reduce 
the probability of i. That's why there's a minus sign. On the other hand, there can be people who show behavior i prime and then eventually change towards i. There's again a transition rate for that. Uh, it's proportional to the number of people showing behavior i, and we have to sum up over uh, i prime, and we have to sum up over this again. So there's an inflow, there's an outflow, and the difference between the two um, basically determines the change in the probability of finding behavior i. This equation is called the master equation. Of course, it masters the process. Uh, it's known from physics and many other areas. It can be applied also to modeling social systems. And the question then is, how does this transition rate look like? Now, it needs to have a con connection to social systems. So we know that there are imitation processes. So those would be occurring more often, the more often we meet other people showing that behavior that we would imitate. There would also be sometimes avoidance processes, in particular, if they don't like a certain person, and that would make us change the behavior to some other behavior and would more, be more frequent. The more frequent are the people or behaviors that um, uh, we are concerned about. And that could be also spontaneous transition. So basically, all of that makes up the transition rate. But in the following, we'll focus on imitation, right? Whereas imitation is, as it turns out, a very efficient way of learning, in particular, if we imitate behavior that are successful. So Focusing on the imitation means uh, spontaneous transitions and avoidance processes are assumed to be zero for now. And then the question is, how would we actually specify the transition rate from a behavior I to I prime in imitation processes? And it makes sense that we would imitate another behavior I prime if we expect that this would increase our success, our expected payoff. So if there's a, this difference is positive, then you know, we would tend to do it. And otherwise, if we expect a deterioration of the outcome for us, we would not do it. That's why there's a maximum function. And so there's a zero in case we expect a deterioration. The expected success, however, is actually calculated by summing up over the interactions with all the other people. P1 basically describes how frequent is it to meet somebody with behavior I prime. And in that case, I would actually um, get a payoff um, P i i prime, and so basically the payoffs that I could get are weighted with the likelihood that those interactions happen, right? This should be actually i prime. So altogether, if we plug this into the previous master equation, we end up with this equation, and that the equation is called the replicator equation. And it has a very intuitive interpretation. But basically, it makes sure that uh, the probability of finding behavior i is between 0 and 1. And um, there is a certain growth rate that is positive in case the expected success of behavior i is greater than the average expected success. Right now, the same equation is known actually from evolutionary biology, and their success is called fitness. And so, basically, those um, those animals or plants that turn out to be more fit than average would spread more. So it's a selection process that's being described by this equation. Right. Any questions over here? We'll get less mathematical, just enough. I wanted to show you that there's a way of justifying the kinds of equations that are the basis of evolutionary game theory 
And this is actually one of the central equations, the replicator equation. And it's based on that assumption that better solutions are being imitated more often. And that creates a selection effect, all right? Now, in the following, we'll just take this equation for granted and we'll plug in different payoff matrices. Now let's go back to the coordination problem and affect uh, what we observe is a phenomenon called lane formation. So as you can see over here, different walking directions are separated from each other. And that is actually something that increases the efficiency of walking because you don't meet anymore so often people walking into the opposite direction. It's just two streams of people. That's the outcome. Moreover, you can see that there's a tendency for people to walk on the right-hand side. It doesn't have to be the right-hand side. There are countries throughout the world where it's the left-hand side. It doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is they coordinate on one behavior, okay? And for the first time I've been looking into this, actually in my diploma thesis, and there's a paper that can out of it, um, a mathematical model for the behavior of pedestrians. And here I basically have been looking into the replicator equation that follows from the payoff matrix for the coordination game that I explained to you already before. So basically we plug that in, we determine the expected success, the average uh, expected success, all of that gets into the replicator equation and that's what we get. Now the interesting question is what does this equation tell us? What would you do to figure that out? Well, what people often do is they look at stationary solutions first. That means the left-hand side, which describes the change with time, is set to zero. And then we find that there are actually three stationary solutions. P equals one half. That means people go to the left with 50% and to the right with 50%. Seems to be the most natural behavior. P equals zero is another stationary solution. P equals one is another stationary solution. This corresponds to everyone walking on the left or everyone walking on the right. So all of those stationary solutions exist. Question is what will happen? For this, people often do something that is called stability analysis. That means you look what happens if you're close to a stationary point and whether you will approach the stationary point in time or the deviation from the stationary point will grow. In that case, we talk about an unstable equilibrium. In the first case, of a stable equilibrium. And it turns out that P equals one half is unstable. That means the most natural behavior to go left with 50% and right with 50% is unstable. Any small deviation from that 50-50 behavior would lead into one of the other actually stable stationary solutions. That means as a result of interactions between people, people would basically learn a behavioral convention. They would either all walk on the right-hand side eventually, most of them, or on the left-hand side. Both of it is equivalent. The most important point is they coordinate on one solution, right? There are many other examples, you know, <laughs> like clocks go into the same direction, you know, they could also go under a counterclockwise, of course, but. At some point in time, people have agreed how the clocks would move. Okay. Yes. For the clocks, I cannot tell, but for the pedestrians, I can tell you that this mechanism that I just described explains why we have a preference for the right hand side in some countries and a preference for the left hand side in other countries. So. 
And that has happened also before. There were cars and traffic rules and all of this. So I bet you will find it in the most remote areas of the world as well. And we can understand it using game theory. That's the nice thing. We don't need to assume that there is a, a natural preference, a law, something that's imposed on the system. There is self-organization and better information, in this case, delay information, that leads to a self-organized outcome, in this case, a behavioral convention. That happens all automatic. You don't even have to think about it. You know, it's really amazing that this self-organization happens. And there are a million other examples of self-organization throughout our society. That's one of the simplest ones. And still, I think it's pretty puzzling and insightful. Now, once you have understood that, you'd say, okay, what about other payoff matrices? And of course, <laughs> you would just change the entries of the payoff matrix and then look at the replicator equation and the stationary solutions and whether those stationary solutions are stable or not, and what you expect from that system. And so, of course, you would do that also with the prisoner's dilemma that was already introduced to you before. It's a game where basically it would be rewarding to cooperate. It would be bad if both people don't cooperate, but it's tempting to defect. It's risky to cooperate. And unfortunately, people will end up defecting. I mean, it's cooperation, even though it would be better for everyone, is unstable. Defection is stable. That's why cooperation breaks down. A tragedy of the commons happens, and you know. It's not good enough to say just bad things happen. We need to think about how to solve this problem. All right. And here is, again, the replicator equation for the general case, where we have um, those payoffs, those four payoffs um, entered. And in fact, uh, as it happens, <laughs> These turn out to be the eigenvalues, so it's easy to determine whether you have a stable stationary point or an unstable one. Depending on the relative size of those different payoffs in the payoff matrix, you will have different kinds of games. In the presence dilemma, cooperation is unstable, defection is stable, and cooperation is never expected to resolve, unfortunately. In the harmony game, cooperation is stable, defection is unstable, therefore cooperation always results. Sounds like heaven, perhaps a little, a little bit boring. Um, then there is, however, also the stack hunt game where both cooperation and defection are stable and the outcome depends on the initial condition. And the snow drift game where cooperation and defection are unstable and a certain fraction of cooperation is stable. Say 30% or so. Now, I mentioned game changers, right? So people have been thinking about how could we change that social dilemma situation like prisoner's dilemma into something that allows for or even promotes cooperation. And all of that comes down to social and biological mechanisms that change the game, that are game changers. I know. And in a sense, all those rules that allow cooperation to happen in a social dilemma context are great inventions, in fact. And perhaps even revolutionary invention it could be happening as a result of biological evolution or by social innovation. In selection, genetic relatedness is one of those mechanisms that does promote cooperation, do co promote cooperation. This is a list actually uh, provided by Martin Novak, one of the most uh, famous uh, game theorists in recent days. And he publishes a lot in Nature and Science and writes many books. And so the second mechanism that he discusses is repeated interactions 
And he's talking about direct reciprocity, like many others. So basically, I help you, you help me, and that obviously supports cooperation. But also, there is indirect reciprocity where I help you, you help somebody else, and somebody help me. And reputation could be supporting such a behavior. Furthermore, there is clustering. And in this case, we may also talk about network reciprocity. And if there is group selection, just imagine there are two islands with people on those islands. And one island people are cooperative for whatever reason. On the other island, they are not. And that in the first island, people will be thriving because cooperation has benefits. On the other island, people will be suffering. So basically, given that situation, um, the cooperative cooperate islands should actually, the number of them should go up in time. Unfortunately, if we basically uh, introduce a ship line between a non-cooperative island and the cooperative island that may let cooperation on the cooperative island collapse. And so perhaps we need um, other kinds of social mechanisms that would allow for such exchange of people between more cooperative and less cooperative places and still cooperation would thrive, okay? And so that already brings us basically to moving in space. So there's spatial games and migratory games. And uh, for the sake of simplicity, people often look at into two dimensional settings. In many cases, uh, there's also the assumption of periodic boundary conditions. I mean, this side is basically connected to that side and that side is connected to that side over here. And so what, uh, Novak and May basically did back in 1992. They simulated the prisoner's dilemma, but in a two dimensional setting. And you know that in a prisoner's dilemma, it's expected that everyone would end up defecting because cooperation is unstable. The big surprise was not so in two dimensional settings when people imitate the best performing strategy in their direct neighborhood. So it's assumed that people would interact just with their direct neighbors. And that obviously allows uh, some cooperation to survive. Red represents defection, blue cooperation, yellow are those that just changed. Still defection is more widespread, but at least there's good news. Cooperation can survive in those spatial settings if we interact just with the neighbors and imitate the best performing strategy, right? And then I wanted to extend that by the mechanism of success-driven migration, because as some of you may know, I've been uh, interested in pedestrian flows and traffic flows, uh, in other words, mobility. And I was interested in how would mobility actually influence the outcome in a social dilemma game such as the prisoner's dilemma. So is there some interaction between mobility and cooperation? And to be honest, I didn't expect any, but I thought it is anyway worth trying. So basically, this is what we did. Uh, we extended uh, the spatial game setting by introducing empty cells, and people could move into those empty cells and, uh, according to certain kind of rules. So first of all, we said there's a certain radius within which people look for empty cells where they expect a better payoff for them. And so they would move exactly when they do expect a better payoff. Otherwise, he would stay. But before we go into this coupling between mobility and cooperation, I'd like to introduce to you a paper which is called Optimal Self-Organization, which is just about mobility. And it's about mobility, not in a two-dimensional space, but in a one-dimensional space. 
a one dimensional space with two subpopulations, two kinds of people, whatever, it doesn't matter really. And initially, we assume that those people would be equally distributed over all the cells in a one dimensional area, right? So it's a uniform distribution of both populations in space. But the question is, what will happen? As they're trying to improve their situation by changing their location. So they would move to neighboring locations if they expect to have a better payoff. Yeah. Now, surprising for some, the uniform distributions disappeared for certain kinds of payoff combinations, not for all payoff combinations. And instead, we had, again, better information. So something self-organized happened, new kind of patterns, as you see them over here. Segregation, such as the lane formation phenomenon we've seen before. Repulsive agglomeration, where people would basically accumulate but different people would accumulate in different places. So it would be something like ghetto formation, uh, often not desirable. And um, there could also be attractive agglomeration where people agglomerate locally um, and actually both populations uh, together, okay? Clustering. And so here um, you see basically how things change over time. So here's time zero. And time, time is changing over here. This is 4,000 yeah. time steps. And you can see initially we have a uniform distribution. In the end, everyone is in the same place. Okay. But it really depends on the combination of different payoff values, what kind of better we get. So we can have quite different outcomes. And all those different outcomes are known from our society to happen in certain conditions. Okay, so it's a pretty powerful model, given that it has so few parameters, it can describe many observed phenomena. It can also be analyzed, uh, analytically even. So on the right, you can uh, see basically the outcome of computer simulations and the dark blue, almost violet area over here. This is the area where the uniform initial distribution stay uniform all the time. There are no better information, okay? In all the other areas that we hear, there will be better information, different kinds. And uh, this is predictable, as you can see on the left, because this is what has been calculated mathematically. Um, and in fact, we know why in this area over here, the uniform distributions will stay, and in the other areas, they disappear and give, right, give way to uh, the pattern formation phenomena of different kinds. Okay, so it's not just we play a little bit with uh, multi agent simulation in space, and something happens uh, that looks interesting, but there's a theory behind that we can understand. We can calculate all this and understand why it happens. Why. All right, and now we'll put both together. The migratory dynamics, the success driven migration with uh, the imitation of uh, the best performing neighboring strategy. And now I'd like to know from you, what do you expect if we have imitation only, no migration? How will the proportion of defectors in red change over time as compared to the cooperators in blue. Yes? Will stay 50-50? No change? Any other bets? Yes? Yes. Just red, I mean, the factors would spread. Any other predictions? Cooperation will what? Increase? Okay, so basically we have all three different bets. Level of cooperation stays the same. Level of cooperation goes down. 
where level of cooperation goes up. What do we expect according to the replicator equation? Red, blue, or red, blue. So, uh, what happens is we'll have more red over time. No. Yes. According to what you expect based on the replicator equation, right? After all, it's a presence dilemma, right? Okay, now another chance. Um, let's make it the world exciting again. So uh, what happens if we have no imitation, but only success driven migration? Would the amount of red stay the same, go up or down? Who thinks will go up? Who thinks will go down? And two things will stay the same. All right, um, let's see what happens. Uh, in fact, this is what is expected because there's no behavioral change. So there are no colors don't change, just the location change, okay? So we can say this, imitation will lead to a decline of population. Migration doesn't change. Both mechanisms don't improve population. So what happens if we combine the two? Who thinks is going to increase the proportion of red? Come on. Where would the table come? Well, who 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 thinks is going to reduce um, uh, increase the number of blue? And can anybody explain why do you think this will happen, even though? Uh, both mechanisms didn't work separately. I guess it's just in the journal that it's taking. <laughs> so let's have a look. Okay, so in fact, what happens is that there's a lot of blue, and it gets even more blue. Red doesn't fully disappear, but what we see is that there's a formation of large cooperated clusters surrounded by defectors that would exploit the cooperators. And the cooperators would run away, look for friends, other cooperative people, and the defectors would chase them, but they are kind of one step ahead. And so what we see over here is there is a correlation of location in space and of behavior. Those are not independent dynamics. All right, so I, I was showing that to Ernst Sphere. You know, who knows Ernst Sphere? Come on, you should all be knowing Ernst Sphere in the game theory course. <laughs> he, you know, he's waiting for the Nobel Prize. Um, so he is one of the most uh, famous game theorists of these times. And I wanted to know what you think about it. And she said, hmm, I'm not sure. Uh, and then uh, he said something a lot more uh, smart as well, of course. Um, and he, he said, what if defectors would basically be allowed to invade the cooperative clusters or we allowed somebody in a cooperative cluster to turn from a uh, from a cooperator into a defector, because then you could really exploit the, all the neighbors. Uh, it would be for that people who exploit all the others. It would be like paradise. Of course, for those exploited, it would be like hell. But okay, so I said, hmm, a good point, but. I do believe that the uh, clusters are actually simple. And so basically what we did is we added noise. We added different kinds of noise and uh, we basically had people accord who according to the imitation rule would have to behave in a cooperative way to flip their behavior with a certain probability.
And the other way around, it's the same thing for detectors. Um, and so suddenly, you know, cooperative people could turn detective. And here we introduce random long distance migration. You know, you go on holiday, you fall in love, you, you can relocate, whatever. Uh, things can happen. Um, and the, the question is, what will be the outcome? Now, this is for the case with no migration. And you see that noise is, in fact, very bad for cooperation. As, as we expected. Now, he's a smart man. And um, then we did the same thing, actually, with the long-term migration. And again, actually, it started so good on Paradise and Earth. Everyone was cooperative. And then all the cooperation is gone after a short period of time. Frustrating, right? And then the question is, what happens if you combine imitation, migration, and both noises? And the guesses. So I had a PhD student at that time, and I asked the PhD student to simulate that situation. I said, uh, to make it more interesting, let's start with a situation where everyone detects in the beginning. And so I went back to the room of the PhD students after a week, and I asked, have you done the simulation? And she said, um, no, I don't want to waste my time. Um, and I said, okay, okay, just you know, do me a favor, please, and do that simulation. I'm really interested in what will happen. So I, I came back another week later and said, uh, I said, did you do the simulation? And said, no, why should I waste my time? So I took my chair, I said, next to, uh, to his chair, said, let's, let's do it together, you know. So we changed the parameters, we started the simulation, it was not much, it did not take much time, you know. We just had to change the parameters and then we ran the simulation. And this is what we got, we finally published in PNES, obviously. So we start with defection by everyone, hell and birth, everyone exploits just everyone else, right? But then migration leads to a situation that dissolves that initial cluster. And it takes a long, long time. So you can have a tea or coffee. And then suddenly, after 25,000 iterations, you have a blue cluster, small, but overcritical. And once you have that, suddenly cooperation spreads. And it spreads quite quickly as compared to the time it takes until you have that supercritical cluster. We call that the outbreak of cooperation. Stable? Yes, it's stable. Now I went back to Ansphere. I said, you know, we have these results. What do you think about it? And she said, hmm, uh, I think it could be a green deer defect because in our assumptions about migration, people were making test interaction. They were exploring the environment before they moved there so they could guess how good the environment would be. So we had to eliminate that. And I created another PNAS paper basically uh, where we found the same effect, just not as strongly pronounced. And then I went back and said, you know, what do you think now? And they said, okay, let's do an experiment. And this experiment involves somebody, uh, Carlos Rocker, who was from my team, and two people, Sonia and Charles, who were from Elsphere's team. He wanted to stay out of this, apparently. And we said, let's do an experiment. You know, how do real people behave? Beyond the trickiness of assumptions of theoretical so we made an experiment in a laboratory. People did not know the strategy of other people. They would they were just able to see whether a cell was occupied or not. That was all they knew. They could move in a certain environment, the blue one, or they interacted with the people in the red environment. And what we found is actually 
migration allows cooperators uh, to avoid exploitation. Uh, migration allows cooperators uh, to form cooperators in neighborhoods and mo mobile cooperators seek smaller groups and mobility is key to success. Obviously, that's just one mechanism. But hey, we changed the game and we changed it in a quite surprising way. And there are more mechanisms to come next time on Thursday. So stay tuned, stay interested, and I hope I will see all of you on Thursday. Thank you very much.